Every interface starts with a simple idea, then it comes alive. But the way it moves is what makes it feel real. We're not chasing effects, we're chasing clarity. We're designing attention, and I'll show you how to build this entire UI intro, step by step, in DaVinci Resolve. And one thing before we start, I decided to split this into two videos. There are details here that deserve more explanation, and I want us to stay focused all the way through. The first thing I did was keep it simple. A white background, a text plus node, and this line. Every interface starts with a simple idea. At this stage, I'm not thinking about animation yet. I'm thinking about design first. So I adjusted the font and size until the text felt balanced on screen. Instead of animating the entire sentence at once, I wanted the text to appear word by word. I duplicated the text plus node, then pasted it as an instance using Shift plus Control plus V, not a normal paste. This keeps everything linked to the original text while still giving me full control over the animation. Next, I went into the Shading tab. On Element 1, I de-instanced it and disabled Enable. This lets me control the animation independently while still keeping the original text as the base. Then I did the opposite on Element 6. I de-instanced it and enabled it because this element will control the the opacity of the words. To make that possible, I changed the appearance from text fill to fill only. This switches the control from letters to words. This is a key decision. We're not animating letters. We're controlling how attention moves across the screen. I slightly adjusted the extended horizontal and vertical values just to give the words more breathing room. Now comes the magic. I right-clicked on the text and added a follower. In modifier tab, I set the delay to 1.66. Not random, just a rhythm that feels natural to the eye. Then swap to shading tab. On element 6, under Opacity, I added a keyframe at frame 0 with a value of 0. Then at frame 15, I brought it up to 1. So the words don't pop in, they reveal themselves. I repeated the same idea in the Transform section. First, I swapped the Transform to Words, then add a keyframe for Offset in frame 15 and in frame 0, push the words slightly to the right. Then I opened the Spline Editor, selected everything, and applied Cubic Out Easing. Because smooth motion isn't about complexity, it's about weight. Timing control. This is what makes it feel professional. To fine-tune the pacing, I jumped to frame 20 and added a keyframe on the delay. 10 frames earlier, I increased the value to 1.88 so the animation starts slower. And in frame 40, I dropped it to 0.86 to speed things up toward the end. This creates natural acceleration. Nothing robotic, nothing flat. Making the text feel alive. One last smart move. I connected the instance node to the original text as a mask. Now the animation is clean, flexible, and fully word by word. After the text animation, I added a transform node. To start the scale animation, I went to frame 28 and scaled the text up to 1.75. Using the pivot point, I adjusted the position so the first two words sit perfectly in the center of the screen. Once everything was aligned, I added a keyframe on the scale value to lock in the animation start. Then I went back to frame 20 and reduced the scale value until it fit exactly the size I was aiming for. Then, in the spline editor, I selected all the keyframes and pressed S to smooth out the motion. Then I added another transform node for the second animation. I explain why I do this in a separate video, so make sure to check that after this one. On the second transform node, I went to frame 38 and added a keyframe on the scale. By frame 60, I increased the scale again to 1.75. This time, I adjusted the pivot point so the last two words land perfectly in the center of the screen. To wrap things up, I went back into the spline editor, selected everything, and pressed S to smooth the animation. This time, I reversed the feel of the curve so it starts slower and accelerates toward the end. Now, let's build the icon container. I started by adding a new background node and connected a rectangle mask to it. At this point, I didn't want a rectangle. I wanted a perfect square. So instead of guessing values, I used an expression on the width. The width is simply the height multiplied by the aspect ratio. This way, I only control one value, the height, and the shape always stays perfectly square. After that, I positioned it where I wanted, disabled solid, and increased the border width to define the outline. Normally, the box scales from the center, but for this animation, I want it to scale from the lower right corner. I break down the math behind this in a separate video, which I recommend watching. Here, I added an expression to the center, wrote the equation, and upgraded the older method by introducing two sliders to control the position more precisely. So I right-clicked in the Mask Inspector and chose Edit Controls. This is where we build the sliders. I created the first one and named it X, set it to appear on the Controls page, and changed the type to a slider control. Then I clicked OK. After that, I repeated the same steps to create the Y slider. Now inside the center expression, I removed the first number and replaced it with X, then removed the second number and replaced it with Y. At this point, the position is fully driven by these two sliders giving us clean, precise control over the box. 
I placed the box right after the text. For the animation, I went to frame 40 and reduced the height all the way down to zero, then added a keyframe. About one second later or 24 frames, I increased the height again until it fit the look I was going for. After that, I opened the spline editor, selected the mask node, selected all the keyframes, right-clicked, and applied easing cubic ease. For the next scene, I jumped to frame 80 and added a keyframe on the X value. 20 frames later, I increased X to slide the box toward the right side. And as always, once the animation is set, I go into the spline editor and smooth out the motion. Next, I added the animated emoji. You can grab icons like this from almost any asset website. I connected it through a merge node, just like a normal composite. To lock the emoji to the box movement, I pinned the rectangle mask and went to the merge node. I right-clicked on the center value and created an expression. I removed the original X value and linked it directly to the X slider of the rectangle. Now both elements move together, perfectly synced. Right after the emoji, I added a transform node to adjust its size and position so it fits naturally inside the box. At this point, everything looks good, but there are two problems. First, the emoji animation ends before the box finishes animating. To fix that, I adjusted the global in and out so the animation starts exactly where I want. Second, I don't want the emoji to appear until the box starts expanding. To fix that, I copied the rectangle mask and pasted it as an instance. I connected this instance as a mask for a second merge node. Then inside the inspector settings, I de-instance solid and enable it. Next, I de-instance softness and increase it slightly to give the edge a softer reveal. Finally, I de-instance border width and reduce it so the emoji stays cleanly inside the box. Now the emoji reveals smoothly only as the box grows. Clean, controlled, perfect. For the final detail, I added a cursor image as a PNG. You'll find this exact asset linked in the description below. I connected the cursor to a merge node and added a transform node to scale it properly. Now I move the pivot point to the tip of the cursor. That way, when I scale it, the movement comes from the cursor head by exactly what I want. To animate the cursor, first select the rectangle mask node and make sure you're on the last frame of the height animation. Then go back to the transform node, move the center so the cursor sits on the top corner of the square, and add a keyframe on center. Next, return to the first frame of the height animation. You can temporarily increase the height to clearly see where the cursor should start. From there, adjust the cursor position so it follows the edge of the box naturally. In the spline editor, I selected only the height keyframes and the cursor transform keyframes, pressed S, and refined the easing. To make the movement feel more natural, I added another transform node after the first one. So, on the first transform, I moved two frames before the last keyframe. Then, on the new transform node, I added a keyframe on center. Next, I jumped to frame 80 and added another center keyframe. I also added a keyframe for angle. After that, what I went back to the first frame and added a keyframe for angle there as well. Now, back at frame 80, I rotated the cursor to 90 degrees so it aligns with the box. But as you can see, the rotation looks wrong. And that's because we forgot one important thing. We didn't move the pivot point to the tip of the cursor on this transform node. So after fixing the pivot point, I set the angle again to 90 degrees and adjusted the position so the cursor hits the left side of the box correctly. Next, I selected the two center keyframes directly in the viewer and adjusted the motion path turning it into a smooth curve instead of a straight line. Then, about 20 frames later, I adjusted the X value so the cursor continues to follow the box naturally. To finish everything off, I opened the spline editor, made sure the rectangle mask was selected as well, selected all the keyframes, and smoothed the animation. And that's it for this video. We'll continue in the next part.